Joe, how are you? I'm doing good, Mark. How are you doing today? You know, ever since you got back from Italy, you are kicking my butt again when it comes to the number of interviews you're doing for the podcast. I think like three to one, four to one, as far as the, uh, the ratio is concerned. And I'm sure our listeners are ecstatic. I don't know. I actually have the easy part. I just do the interviews. You deal with all of the stuff in the background. So thank you. I appreciate it. I just do the interviews. And this time for this show, I don't fall asleep, folks. I talked to an attorney and it was actually a really good call. And here's why I, I, I had it. Her name is Rochelle Friedman. She's from Walk Law Firm. And, you know, look, with physical products businesses and the transfer of an Amazon seller account, everybody has questions about how to go about doing it, whether it's a U.S.-based account or one that's international. And I came across Rochelle uh, through uh, some other folks that I work with, and I had a call with her. And I just picked up the phone and I called her and, and, and chatted with her. She, look, she does close transactions for Quiet Light Brokerage, for Empire Flippers, for website closures and You guys know who they are, so it's okay to mention them, right? Uh, And I know she does that, so I wanted to confirm with her uh, what the process is, what she does. And shockingly, Mark, it's the same way that we do it, believe it or not. Uh, And she goes into detail about it, and she goes into great detail about it. Not only that, she talks about contracts in general. She represents both uh, buyers and sellers. She's a contract attorney that came from the corporate world representing businesses, uh, everyday household businesses. She was uh, their attorney, very good one uh, in the corporate world, left, went out on her own, and now represents both buyers and sellers in transactions. Uh, and I think it's worth listening to. I think it's really, really important, as you and I have talked about, how important planning is. Don't wake up and decide to sell, but plan to sell. Uh, same thing can be said for an attorney. Talk to one. Get your ducks in a row. Uh, and make sure that you're doing the right thing as you go into your transaction so you can do it with confidence. All right, I'm going to put you on the spot because you said, you know, we're going to address in this uh, podcast episode, how do you transfer an Amazon business and how are people doing it pretty much across the board. But for anyone that uh, already knows how to do that or has done that, what else do we cover in this episode? Uh, She covers uh, the two big stomach ache clauses in contract negotiations, that being the non-compete and the indemnification clause. Uh, I think the indemnification clause is the bigger of the two because we do a pretty good job uh, up front addressing the non-competes. And so if you do that work up front in the client interview and work with the seller on that to make sure they understand what a non-compete is and make sure there aren't going to be any issues, never really a problem. The the hard one to wrap your your brain around, your hands around, is the indemnification clause uh, and what that is from a seller standpoint. You sell your business, you think you're done, you got 100,000, 200,000, a million dollars in your bank account, you move on about your merry way, you sleep really well at night because you get a bunch of money in your account. Well, your buyer's attorney is going to have something in there that uh, is going to have them reach back into your bank account and take some money out if you lied or cheated or stole or did anything fraudulent in any way. Now, you should sleep well if everything was done right. But if there's anything that wasn't, they're going to put that in there. And they're going to put that in there anyway. Uh, and the big question is, how long is that grace period for? Is it six months or 12 months or 18? Uh, and then how much is it for? And Rochelle, you know, towards the end of the podcast, she laughs and she chuckles and she talks about how well, she has one standard when she's representing the buyer, and she has a completely other standard <laughs> when she's representing the seller. So it's good to hear from both sides for sure. But the stomach uh, ache clauses are really important uh, in there as well. That's fantastic. And those are easily uh, just almost guaranteed edits every time we send out a purchase agreement on those two clauses. Guaranteed. Uh, you always see stuff. All right, let's get into it. I'm excited to see what she has to say about all of this, including the indemnification stuff. Let's go to it. Hey folks, it's Joe from Quiet Light Brokerage, and today I've got Rochelle Walk from Walk Law Firm on the uh, on the line with me today. How you doing, Rochelle? I'm doing great, Joe. How are you today? I'm doing well. I have a sister-in-law named Rochelle, so if I mispronounce your name uh, during the <laughs> podcast at all today, that's the reason why I apologize yeah. in advance. Not a problem at all. <laughs> as we uh, as we talked about a little bit uh, before rec- recording, uh, we don't do fancy introductions, so if you could just give the audience a little bit of background on yourself, tell them about who you are and the work you do, that'd be great. Sure. Thanks, Joe. First of all, thanks for having me on. I uh, appreciate the opportunity. 
And um, my background's actually a little bit complicated because I have been practicing law for 33 years. But unlike a lot of other lawyers, most of my practice has been as a general counsel or as the chief administrative officer of very large public companies. So most of my time spent as a lawyer has actually been as a business person. And I like to explain myself as a business person who happens to also be a good lawyer. Excellent. And when I started this firm, I was at the point where I was leaving a major public company, decided I wanted to do something different, and decided I wanted to use the same skills I garnered as a business person and lawyer for really large public companies and turn it into something that would work well for small to mid-sized companies. So during my years in my big company world, I worked heavily in consumer products. Um, I was head of licensed brands for Sherwin-Williams, brands like Martha Stewart, Ralph Lauren. I worked with Dutch Boy. I worked with Thompson Minwax, Krylon, very famous brands. And then uh, I left there and I was at a company called Ogilvy Norton. It was mining and minerals. We had clients and customers like Home Depot, but we also had heavy industry as clients and lots of engineers. And then ultimately I went to a company called Anchor Glass and it was consumer glass. Some of your favorite beverages, as a matter of fact, would be bottled in the glass containers with, you know, beer, wine, Maker's Mark, you know, some famous brands. So my career has always been around famous brands and lots of retail. So when I looked at what I could do seven years ago when I started this practice, I thought about it and said, I can really understand consumer brands. I really understand branding. I really understand intellectual property, but it's a new world and we need to be able to do it online. And I dove into e-commerce, understanding how Amazon works, how eBay works, how Jet works. Of course, some of those came later. Uh, how Walmart.com as a marketplace work. Walmart used to be my customer as at Sherwin-Williams, and now here at Walmart.com is a completely different animal. And I dove into that. My practice has always been heavily mergers and acquisitions. So about 50% of our practice is the mergers and acquisitions of businesses. And seven years later, that has become a huge footprint of Amazon sellers, online sellers, e-commerce businesses that are seeking to flip. Entrepreneurs who have created, you know, they've created great brands, um, but in order to take them, to exploit them to the next level, they need a lot more bandwidth. And it's therefore their time to move out of that business um, having spent a lot of years buying and selling mom and pop paint stores for Sherwin Williams and mom and pop paint brands and sundry brands, it's no different. It's just now we're doing it through e-commerce instead of bricks and mortar. Okay, so about fifty percent of your business is uh, the M and A side. The other side is is what working with people on intellectual property branding, things of that nature. We're like their outsourced general counsel. It can be everything from intellectual property and branding to uh, to possibly contracts, employee issues, independent contractor issues, uh, tax issues, okay. really almost anything they need, leases, <clears throat> supplier agreements, um, everything you might imagine a general counsel doing. Gotcha, gotcha. So for folks listening, the reason I have Rochelle on the line today is because a lot of you have asked during the buy or sell process if quite I can recommend an attorney. And we have several that we work with. Uh, Sean Hussein at the Ecom Law Group is is terrific. We work with him yeah. often, and Rochelle knows him. And came across Rochelle, and we were talking about the transfer process of an Amazon business. And I know right. that you've worked with uh, all of the website business broker firms that are at a, a high level, like Quiet Light. Right. Um, right. And you've been on, on both sides of the transaction. Do you, right. do you prefer or do you most often work with the buyer of a, a business representing the buyer in contract negotiations or do you, do you find yourself on the seller side more often? It's really about equal. And um, we, we don't really have a preference. We're, we're perfectly prepared to work with both buyers and sellers. Uh, buyers and sellers have different needs. And one of the things that I think 
we're pretty good at. And just so you know, we're, we're a firm of three full-time lawyers. We are about to affiliate with a bigger national firm who also does quite a bit in e-commerce and emerging businesses. And we can, I'm not prepared to tell you who and the details of that, but that's coming down the pike. So we'll have a lot more bandwidth. Uh, but what's important about us as that we understand the difference between what a buyer needs, what a seller needs, financing it. Uh, if both you're a buyer and a seller, how it's being financed matters. And understanding how these Amazon accounts transfer. You know, sometimes transferring the account actually isn't in your best interest for the buyer. Sometimes it's the only solution for the buyer. Well, let's and talk about that. You have to assess about, that. You know that, that, that listener's ears just perked up because we're talking about the transfer of an Amazon account. You yeah. and I both know, as does everyone yeah. who has an Amazon account, that you know, the terms of service says that the Amazon account is not generally. transferable. And they, right. There's a bracket <laughs> in there that says generally. Uh, to me, logically, it never made sense that uh, you could build an amazing brand on Amazon and never be able to sell that. Uh, and I've, I've had experience direct with Amazon, and they've proven that uh, they do, in fact, allow the transfer of accounts. But of course. Tell, tell, tell us, tell the audience, tell me, uh, how have you seen an Amazon account most often transferred with the different transactions that you've done with the top website and business brokerage firms? Sure. You know, a lot of times it's very much behind the scenes. If you are actually selling the ownership interest in the business, you're not really transferring the Amazon account, although Amazon may disagree with that, but you're really not transferring the Amazon account. You're transferring ownership interest in your business. And the only thing you're doing with the Amazon account is actually maybe changing an EIN, if depending on what you're buying and if you're getting the EIN of the new business, and probably changing where you want the banking to go. I've even had situations where we haven't had to change the banking at all. If you're buying the assets, however, and you're leaving the ownership interest of the business behind, but getting all of the assets of the business, you're going to need to go in and possibly change the name of the owner of the account, change the, certainly the EIN or the employer ID number, change the bank account number, and there may be some other things you're going to change as well. But there are some things that we recommend sellers do, and frankly, it's better for buyers to help to help ease the pain of that process. First of all, we've never had Amazon stand in the way. As a matter of fact, if you text Amazon, they'll even tell you how to go in and do it. So as much as they say it's generally not transferable, they actually don't get in the way as long as what you're doing is not disruptive. So where will they get in the way? If the IP address of the person making the change is different than the IP address of the person who has been running the account, Amazon's going to have a big flag for fraud. And they will get in the way. And they may shut down the account. What they usually will do is let the sales continue. However, you can't access your account until somebody verifies that it was an intentional change. And they usually give you a couple of weeks to do that verification. Although my clients are typically through that verification process within a couple of hours. It may take Amazon a few hours to, to flag you, but watch for the flag. It's usually going to come to the seller. One of the great ways to avoid any of those issues if you're using a VPN to access your account in the first place. Then you transfer the account with the VPN as all locked in. You're not changing the IP address. And that way, when you do this transition, there's no issue of the buyer or the seller plugging in the information as long as they're all going through the same VPN. Similarly, let the seller make the changes. Generally, the seller makes the changes. If it's a big enough account, Amazon may flag it for fraud anyway, but within a couple of hours, the seller will get that email or will get contact from his, uh, his or her uh, account rep, and that pain will be immediately fixed. We do it all the time, and we haven't had an issue. 
So do you end up having to have uh, contact yourself with Amazon if, uh, if there's an issue or is it just something that the seller contacts them and it's resolved eventually? So my rule of thumb, leave your lawyers out of Amazon at all times. We may be in the background helping draft the emails, helping respond to the emails. They always come from our client who has the most contact with their Amazon rep. That's the, seller, want, that's the owner of the seller account. Exactly. We want the least amount of disruption in the communications. Amazon really doesn't need to hear from your lawyers. Okay. You just need to work directly with Amazon. And frankly, it's a fraud detection problem. Amazon doesn't want to be caught where somebody somehow hacked into your system, changed your accounts, and you later come back and accuse Amazon of having changed your accounts or having diverted your money. So you can't blame Amazon for what they're doing. You just have to be able to work with them and be prepared for maybe a day or two of disruption. But typically, we haven't seen it disrupt sales. Okay. You know, we've seen product takedowns disrupt sales, but we have not seen that transfer of the account disrupt sales. Excellent. Okay. Let's, um, let's take a few things. We talked about you're your, your seeing the most method text, and then we talked about the VPN, and then you talked mm -hmm. about, well, I want to talk about uh, different Amazon countries. So uh, okay. what I've seen in the transfer process is, is the same. You know, um, we wrote the 10 steps to transferring an Amazon account in 2000. 16, I think. Uh, and, and, and the process that we see is actual phone calls um, to Seller Central saying, hey, look, I'm transferring, mm -hmm. um, transferring the business, one of the assets, my business is the Amazon seller account. How do I transfer control to the new owner? And they do the same thing you just talked about in text is right. they give you written instructions and they send it via email. Exactly. Now, our, our clients tell us it, you know, sometimes they get lucky in the first call, it works, and sometimes it takes 10 calls. Right. Uh, the first say, oh, no, you can't do that. And then on the 10th, say, oh, yeah, okay, know exactly what you're talking about. They do it. Um, I've had some chats, uh, you know, with Amazon chats yeah. do the same thing, but you said text. Now, do you mean email? Do you mean the chats? What do you mean by text? I mean the chats. You mean the chats. Okay. And it, it's usually a seller central chat system. Okay. And we even have um, videos and screenshots of the chats that some of our clients have had. Okay. Uh, remember with Amazon Seller Central, you are dealing with, I'll, I'll, I'll describe this the way my husband describes pizza. It's only as good as the 16-year-old making it. <laughs> when you order a pizza from the pizza parlor, the quality control is a little bit lax. Well, with Amazon, it's not a quality control problem, but the experience of a customer service rep is only what that person has had as experience. And depending on how specific you are and how clear you are and what you're trying to ask them will depend on how good they are at getting into the Amazon separate instructions and pulling back and telling you what to do. The more experienced reps are very good at telling you exactly how to go into Seller Central and make the changes. I like so, that. I, I wonder if, if on, the, uh, on the chats that the more experienced reps answer the chats versus the phone calls. Do you know if there's any data behind that or is that just an assumption? No, I have no idea. Okay. I, I have not seen that. Um, and I really don't know. And remember, the chats are being answered by people all over the world. Okay. Same as, same as the phone calls then, too. Exactly. Okay. Good. So uh, just to back up a little bit uh, of what you're saying, um, I've had uh, many, many Amazon, quite like brokerages, has many Amazon transactions uh, transfer just that very same way. Um, I personally have a situation for folks listening where I had an Amazon uh, account that had a gold status. I don't know if that exists okay. anymore, but it was called a gold status. And that meant that it was old enough and large enough where they had uh, an Amazon representative assigned sure. to their account. So they had somebody they could always reach out to. And during that uh, process, they reached out to that person and said, hey, look, transfer selling the business, one of the assets of the business is my account. Uh, how do we take care of this? And that individual went to Amazon Legal and said, hey, look, this is what we're doing. And Amazon Legal provided a form. Right. And all they wanted to know was the name of the buyer. Mm -hmm. 
And it's always been a theory that Amazon wants to make sure that those that have been banned are permanently banned. So they wanted right. to know the name of the buyer. So uh, to, to do a search to see if they'd been banned. That's all they did was check the name of the buyer and the transfer went through with no problem at all. So just backing up what you said there, the VPN, um, I had Norm Farrar on the podcast. Norm is an yeah. uh, expert in SOPs and marketing Amazon, he guest on many, many podcasts. Um, Norm recommended the same thing. And for those that are listening that do a lot of traveling to different events and whatnot, you're all at mastermind groups and you're getting advice. Right. If everyone is using the local uh, VPN and there's a hundred people that get a, you know, sitting and listening to an expert and they get a great idea, they all log on to their Amazon account using that, you know, that IP address in the local wireless, local hotel or whatever it might be. Right. The Amazon bots are going to go crazy and you're all going to get shut exactly. down. Exactly. Uh, so Norm does that. Norm recommends VPNs. Uh, Rob Green, who uh, does the same thing, high-level seller, a lot of podcasts, a lot of speaking, a lot of events. Uh, he's got three or four different uh, seller accounts, a different VPN for each one. So he goes e even yeah. to a further level. So All of my biggest clients are using VPNs. It is the smoothest, simplest way. As you said, it's not just a matter of selling your business and having the VPN set up. It's actually an operational benefit. Because what it also means is you get bigger. It's not just one person who needs to get into that account. You may have a team of people who have to go in and do different things at different times. They could be all over the world, but everybody's coming in through the same VPN. There's no confusion to the Amazon bot. And frankly, it's a lot more secure. I agree. I agree. And it's, you know, 10 to $15 a month. Right. Uh, you should Absolutely. be doing it. Absolutely. Okay, let's talk uh, countries. You haven't talked about countries yet. You haven't said right. Amazon.com, EU, uh, right. whatever it might be. Is, are you finding <clears throat> the same transfer process to be successful for Amazon.com, the UK, Germany, France, Italy, et cetera? Or are you doing something a little different depending upon the country? So generally, we are using the same transfer process. Now, one thing that I have to pull out when <clears throat> you are – Dealing with other countries, you may have a VAT or VAT or ad valorem tax issue. And generally, that is not transferable. So you are going to need, the new company is going to need to set up their own tax ID in those countries. And there may be a change that has to be made and it may lag a little bit. Uh, Typically, we use the same process. Most of our clients are driving their business through Amazon.com in the United States. It's a much smaller amount of traffic and a much smaller amount of sales going through the other countries, although it's starting to pick up. It's starting to get a lot bigger. Uh, but we haven't, we haven't focused as much on those international accounts, but we haven't had any trouble transferring them either. We've just used the same process. There's been no disruption except for making sure that we have the ad valorem tax information necessary for those businesses. Gotcha. And um, it, it's been pretty seamless. Gotcha. Okay. We, we've experienced the same thing in, in regards to the, uh, you know, the value added taxes for people listening. Uh, we did a podcast with Alex Lyon, from uh, a vast tax advisors uh, three weeks ago, uh, depending upon when this launches. Right. Let, let's put it this way. It launched uh, the 1st of June or so. Uh -huh. Great detail on how to set it up, uh, what the pitfalls Perfect. are and trying to do it on your own and the cost associated with it. And, and we also addressed uh, the transfer of a seller account and when to set that up and, and what comes right. first. And uh, she sort of detangled everything and it's not all that complicated. Perfect. Have you had a situation uh, where the, the, the seller wanted to keep their seller account but transfer the brand out to a new owner? And if yes, tell us about it, please. We have, actually. We've had it, we've had it both ways, where the seller wanted to keep their account because maybe their seller account had multiple brands, multiple ASINs, and they were only selling one set of, of their uh, product lines, maybe one brand. And um, if that happens, that has to be upfront at the beginning of the deal. Everyone needs to understand at the beginning of the deal whether or not the account is going to transfer. 
And the buyer needs to appreciate that they may not be getting the seller account. And frankly, sometimes it's not the worst thing. For instance, if the buyer is already an active Amazon seller, the buyer may be very happy to have its current Amazon account just take over the ASINs. And that is a very smooth transition. It's literally a, a relisting of the ASINs, moved over, and then the seller account just delists those takes them off their registry. Uh, yeah, the only, the only challenge with it, and let me just pipe in, it's, is um, the inventory. Uh, the inventory in right. the uh, FBA account, uh, Amazon will not transfer it from one FBA account to another. So you've got to time it so that so, exactly. new inventory is coming into that new seller account. You might leave the older account open, uh, still sell through that inventory, but right. uh, the new owner gets the revenue or profit. And the seller, if they sell through the existing inventory, may do it for the benefit of the buyer. Yeah. So yeah. that the money still transfers on all of that inventory and we just do an accounting. To exactly. The extent. You're exactly right, Joe. That is what happens. Now, let me give you another scenario. And I actually have this scenario right now. I have a seller I represent who has multiple seller accounts and um, he, they have multiple brands in their seller account and they're about to sell that business. That particular seller account is, is poorly rated. It has had lots of negatives for a whole variety of reasons. Part of it is because it's very old. Okay. And part of it is because of mistakes that were made early on. Uh, but the nature of that particular business, the products they sell, makes a lot of money but the seller account itself is not great. And the buyer is actually going through the process right now and determining if they would be better off with just starting a brand new seller account and not mm -hmm. taking that history. Because again, you're picking up the history of something that isn't really great. Yeah, I guess it's better to, to have no history if the old history is, is very poor. Um, but the challenge is, you know, let, let, let's... Let's back up and start with, for those listening, buyers or sellers, if you have multiple brands in one seller account, think right. about that transfer process. Someday you may wake up and say, you know what, I'm tired. I, I, I right. want to just unload something and put some, put some money in the bank, set something aside so I can see something for the work that I've done. Um, the, the best way to do that is to have a clean transaction, you know, separate LLC, clean documents, clean financials, right. and a separate seller account. Separate you, VPN. Separate VPN, exactly. You can have multiple seller accounts. I've talked to people right. that have six, seven different seller accounts. You just have to get permission from Amazon and they will grant it again, uh, like Rochelle said at the beginning, right. uh, you know, you just have to talk to the right person at Amazon. Or, and you have to do it right. You have to keep those businesses as separate businesses with separate seller accounts. They're not gonna let one business have multiple seller accounts. Okay, that's good information. Uh, and it's hard for people when they bootstrap things and they, they test and certain things take off right. uh, and they think this is great. Um, selling a business is more of a challenge and you gotta have those things as separate as possible. I can, tr I can tell you right now, right. if you're gonna spend $1,000 setting up a separate LLC and an extra thousand a year doing the accounting for it uh, and maybe another you know, $600 a year for right. a separate QuickBooks account, you will get that money back tenfold uh, in, in the exactly. sale and transfer of your account. So it's absolutely uh, worth it to do it. Um, so in terms of transferring the brand out of an account, here's the drawbacks is that, you know, your buyer has to have uh, another Amazon account with good or better ratings than the one that you have. Otherwise, your right. buyer pool is going to shrink. And when your buyer pool shrinks, uh, the potential value of your business shrinks as well. Uh, That's right. I've talked to many experts, and I've named a few of them here that I've talked to about the transfer of a brand into a brand right. new seller account, and they all think they're like, "That's crazy." If it's if it's got if a good brand is in a good seller account, right. transferring that to a brand new seller account, they don't know anybody. Makes no sense, about it, and it's just risky. Exactly. Um, I have a transaction that's that's uh, going on now uh, where the buyer uh, the buyer had uh, he just purchased purchased an Amazon seller account. Uh, happens to be in a different country than the U.S., uh, mm -hmm. and it's got a great, uh, great seller rating. And they're going to buy another brand 
and move it into that same seller account and it's in that same right. country versus taking over their seller account because the, the seller feels that there's, there's risk there that uh, he doesn't want to take on. Right. So there's lots of different ways to do these transactions. And I, I hope that people can hear Rochelle through your uh, communications that you're an attorney that actually thinks a little bit outside the box uh, and uh, understands that there's always two parties that are coming to the table and both have, right. both have to be happy and satisfied in order to close a transaction. Right. Wouldn't you agree? Right. I absolutely agree. And you know, Joe, one of the other things that I, I like to talk to people about is, remember, it is the seller account you're selling. And very often that's what's driving the value. But also keep in mind, there may be other things you're selling, such as techniques or technology that you've invented to support your seller account that helps drive the business to that account, or possibly even your own know-how, and they may need you as part of the transition team. Um, there may be issues with a non-compete, especially if you're running multiple brands and you're selling one channel or one brand. So as you're getting ready to sell your business, you really have to think about what it is you're selling. It's the seller account, it's the brand, but what else is being sold and can you really sell the things that the buyer wants? Yeah, all of that should be done up front. Uh, what, the worst thing to do, folks, is to wake up and go, okay, I, I'm tired, I wanna sell my business, so I'm gonna call right. a broker. That's the worst thing to do. The best thing to do is to do what Rochelle, Rochelle, Rochelle is talking about yeah. and plan it in advance. Think, okay, maybe someday I'm gonna sell my business. Let me just sort right. of get my ducks in a row. Maybe I never will, and maybe I'll pass it on to my kids. But in the event I get tired and want to move on, I want to be prepared. Right. Uh, and you want to think about all those things in advance and, and have those sort of all those ducks in, right. a, in a row. Right. Um, in, the, in a contract negotiation, let's t touch on, on this briefly. Yeah. Uh, both buyers and sellers, you see both sides of the transactions all the time. Right. Uh, what what are the stomach ache clauses that you see in an asset purchase agreement and sure. how do you rectify them? Give me a couple examples. So I can tell you the top two are always the non-compete and the, um, the indemnification provisions. Those are always numbers one and two, sometimes, you know, in whichever order you want to put them in. But those are the two things that are almost always the most concerning. So the non-compete. The non-compete sounds easy. I agree I'm going to sell my business that sells paintbrushes and I promise not to compete in paintbrushes. Well, the buyer may be looking at it a little differently. The buyer may say, I don't want you to compete in anything that has anything to do with paint or anything that has anything to do with art or possibly anything that, does, that has anything to do with uh, home or or other kinds of activities, very often they're going to look at Amazon categories and they're going to say, I don't want you to compete in the category in which the product you sold is in. I've even had a buyer say, I don't want you to be able to compete in any category on Amazon or in any category in which I, the buyer, may be in now or in the future. Very Did you tell them they topic. were nuts? Because I would tell them they're nuts. <laughs> well, of course, we say it as politely as we can. We don't <laughs> okay. like to queer deals, but those are always fight issues. And my suggestion, although I know people don't like to deal with difficult issues up front when you're in the dating period, but my suggestion is that you understand the non-compete from the start of the transaction I at agree. the LOI point. Absolutely. The second we, 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 we put all of that in our, in our client interviews in depth. We ask about the non-compete. We talk to our sellers in detail about it uh, because that is an important part of it. Uh, from right. the seller side, look, if this, the person selling right. the business is selling glass fishing poles uh, right. and, and they want to sell that business but still sell fishing poles, it's too close. And right. I'll tell them right up front, as will any broker at Quiet Light Brokerage, it's not going to work. Buyers are going to have a problem with that. Uh, I've never had a situation, though, I got to tell you, Rochelle, uh, where a buyer has uh, made an offer and said uh, that we don't want you to sell anything on Amazon. That's simply too right. broad. Uh, I've never had anybody narrow it down to the category either, because uh, if you think about uh, home and garden, yeah, it's just it's just 
too broad. It's usually been specific to the product and sometimes, uh, you know, a, a little bit around that product. Uh, let's say that if, if it's, um, how do I pick one that is, is not an actual. We'll uh, talk about your fishing poles. Sure. Some people will say nothing in marine. So does that mean I can't sell a boat? A boat is really different than a fishing pole. Does that mean we can't sell a beach fishing, mat? Fishing tackle or things of that nature. Yeah. Uh, I would say that it's, you know, you can, you can dance beyond that specific right. product a little bit, but you can't go, okay, fishing pole and maybe lures, but you can't go to boats, right? Right. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and the reason I bring it up is I have had, and I will tell you where it is, the, a lot of the buyers today are private equity firms. True. And they're doing roll-ups. Mm -hmm. And those private equity firms feel like they're buying the expertise of the person, not just the product. And they are all over the idea that the expertise of the person could be used to teach or develop somebody else to sell against them. And as these private equity firms are rolling up multiple brands, multiple areas, and they're diversifying, they have gotten very aggressive on this non-compete language. So we actually have seen, as a matter of fact, I saw language that was so broad that I said, we absolutely can't have our clients sign it because she couldn't even work at the makeup counter in Macy's because Macy's has an online site. And even though she'd be working at the store, it would be technically a violation. Right. And, and the private equity guy said to me, well, we didn't mean that. I said, well, that's what your language says, though. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I see where you're coming from. And we were able to bring it back. And, and this is really where the skills of your lawyer and your broker come in, because the combination of the two help bring people back to reality. But it's important that conversation happens up front. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I find the vast majority of, of deals go off the rails at some point. And the difference between a good lawyer and a good broker and a great lawyer and a great broker is pulling right. that back on the rails. Um, I think the ability to have open communications and occasionally, uh, right. you know, maybe I'm wrong. I don't mean to throw you in a category here, but yeah, you know, I think attorneys when they, when they respond to an asset purchase agreement and do edits and, and, and send it directly via email um, it's, and make comments, it's vastly different than right. if they actually, Get, get on to the point phone. where they get on a phone and speak to the other attorney. It's it's absolutely. You guys are you guys are brutal in in emails and comments, but then when you get on the phone, you can generally work things out. So um, one of the challenges, Joe, is that really it, it it's more than there was, but today there are very few lawyers who have experience in this kind of business. Yep. And the typical document we're seeing has all sorts of stuff in it that makes no sense for an Amazon business. It's got loads of employee representations on employee benefit plans. It has loads of pages on environmental reps and warranties because they've taken the standard ABA form or the standard form they always use and they send it and say, this is our asset purchase agreement. Right. And people like, and I'll use Sean Hussein as a great example. I do a lot of deals with him. Uh, people like us look at that and we just simply white out all those pages. Right. So we start off with 75 pages. When we're done, it's about 35 and 40 of them were just garbage. Let's, uh, let's jump to the indemnification clause, stomachache yes. clause number two. Tell us about that one. So indemnification, for people who don't understand what it is, it's the clause that says, if something goes wrong after the sale, here's when and how I might be able, not, I, the buyer, may be entitled to get some money back or get some protection, get some defense. So understood, anything that happened in your business prior to the sale of the business is certainly the seller's responsibility. Anything that happens in the business after the sale of the business is the buyer's responsibility. But then there's the foggy world. What about product that was produced by the seller, but not sold until the buyer owns that inventory. What about claims made on the websites, claims made in the marketing materials, uh, claims of natural or organic that the buyer is relying on that the seller created? Or what about simple, the business didn't do very well? 
you told me this business is a million dollar a month business, but when the buyer takes it over, the thing tanks, the lightning deals go away. There's all sorts of speculation. The supplier doesn't supply quite as well to the buyer as the seller. And, and then the buyer comes in and says, how do I get money back for this? It's not what I expected. It's really, really important that going into the deal, you understand what the caps and limits are. What's the maximum amount of money a buyer can get back and under what circumstances? And is there a deductible? So for instance, fraud. Okay, everyone understands that if the seller committed fraud, the buyer's gonna expect their money back and probably all of their money. At the same time, let's just assume that what really happened is that the seller had representations and warranties and in it, it said that the financial statements that are attached are true and correct. And it turns out one line has one number transposed. It doesn't change the business. It doesn't change the quality of the business. It is an immaterial mistake. Should the buyer get money back? Should they get all their money back for that? Should they get any money back for that? And so that's what I would call a typical representation warranty. Let's assume there was, as a result of that mistake, there really was a little bit of a, of a material um, implication. Well, it, let's say it turned into a $10,000 problem. So what should the buyer get for that $10,000 problem? The language and the representation warranties are very important. What we recommend is that going into the deal, there be a very clear conversation about the difference between fraud, which might mean you get your purchase price back or maybe even the right to unwind the transaction, versus a, an unintentional misrepresentation or a mistake or something, something hiccups that you didn't anticipate. And we recommend that you have a clear cap. What's the maximum amount that the buyer can get back in the event of those issues? And it might be, we, we generally we see somewhere between 10 on the low side and 30% on the high side as the range, that's today's market, as the range for those kinds of, of uh, indemnifications. We might see a basket. So we might see something that says, but if it's all under $25,000 or under $50,000, depending on the size of the deal, the buyer gets nothing bad back. It's just a, a, a small de minimis issue. Whereas if it's hundreds of thousands of dollars of issue, there might be a cap on it. Uh, there are fundamental representations such as title to the assets. And if it turns out the seller sells you something and didn't have title to it, of course the buyer is going to expect to be completely reimbursed for that. There are questions about whether or not you'll pay for the attorneys. These are provisions that both your broker understands and your attorneys understand. I strongly recommend that you line up an attorney at the beginning of the deal at the LOI phase of this. And you also line up an accountant who, as a seller. Well in advance. Well, well in, in advance. advance. For, CPA, for sure. I hope you have one already for those listening that are sellers. You know, the, 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 the four pillars that Mark and I talk about, the risk, the growth, the transferability, and the documentation are all critical. And you can't have that documentation in place without having a good, A, bookkeeper, and B, CPA to figure out what you're going to be right. left with after the sale. That's why I don't want you to wake up and go, okay, I'm ready to sell. List right. my business, please. You, you want to think about those things in advance. I did a uh, podcast with um, Dave Bryant uh, from Ecom Crew. Mm -hmm way right. back on importing from China. And Dave talks about how he planned in advance selling his business and renegotiated the cost of goods sold on certain SKUs over a 12-month period, saved himself about $40,000 and got that back in a, you know, a multiple of three when he sold the business. So all of these things are really important. As you talk about the indemnification, as you talk about the non-compete, for those listening, you know, I'm sure some of you, you know, Nod it off, right? Just, just like you did when right. I talked about the doing the valuation and cash versus accrual accounting. You can make 
so much more money in the sale of your business someday if you ever decide to sell or your heirs do when you take care of these things in advance, when you plan, when you have proper documentation. Now, all of that will make these stomach ache clauses like the indemnification, not an issue. Proper documentation in advance of the sale, you'll know that you did the right thing with your customers. You know that you don't have any potential liabilities. You know that your financials are correct. That transposing of the number, um, you know, is it material? Is it immaterial? I've never had it happen. Pretty small. If it's immaterial, it's immaterial. Uh, I always go back to, you know, things can be worked out for the most part with math and logic. Emotion is the wild card. A good attorney, a good broker will help keep those emotions in check and on track. Uh, to closing. And I think, you know, one of the reasons why I wanted you on the podcast, Rochelle, is because you seem to apply that math and logic to, you know, the conversations that we've had. And you realize really, really strongly that both buyers and sellers need to be happy at at closing. Otherwise, the transaction is not going to close. There's no point. A one-sided deal is never going to close, folks. So if you have an attorney right. that is, you know, fighting tooth and nail for, uh, you know, indemnification clause, it's going to have, you know, the seller, you know, not cover anything, not cover any risk for the buyer. It, it's not going to close. It right. has to be comfortable for both parties. Um, I always tell uh, a story. I'm not going to tell the full story, but it, it, it boils down to I will not take on a client that is married to an attorney that has an attorney <laughs> that's a mother, father, sister, brother that's going to do their contract negotiations because they right. fight like rabid dogs for things that, you know, there's one tenth of one percent chance of it happening, but they fight like crazy to make sure that their client, their relative is fully protected because they're going to have to have drinks with that relative at the, the next Fourth of July barbecue. Uh, deals fall apart. Right. For, for those clauses that we've talked about, more the indemnification in my experience than the non-compete because, again, a good broker will handle that right. up front and take care of it up front and, and educate both buyer and seller pre-LOI. Now, just one last thing on the LOI phase in terms of when to hire the attorney, Rochelle. Our experience is the, the letter of intent is, is non-binding and fully contingent on the asset purchase agreement. Uh, right. well, on, on due diligence and the further detailed asset purchase agreement. So right. we don't recommend that uh, clients uh, hire an attorney for the uh, language in the letter of intent because it says it right in there. It's non-binding and contingent on those things. Uh, I think as long as some of these points or all of these points are worked out in advance, you know, particularly the non-compete that it's, that it's in there, uh, that that 9.5 mm-hmm. times out of 10, it's not an issue. Occasionally, we have a little further negotiations yeah. in the S purchase agreement. Would you agree, though, that, yeah. that you should be hired uh, once the LOI is signed and, and, and for the asset purchase agreement negotiations? Let me frame this a little differently. Okay. If you're getting ready to sell your business, you should have a lawyer lined up who's taken a look at your business to make sure your ducks are in a row. Make sure if you have supply agreements that they are written, signed, enforceable supply agreements. Because if you're planning on selling those supply agreements, then you have to have assignable supply agreements. So what I always suggest is, just like you have your accountant in your back pocket, you ought to have an attorney that you work with that's helped you think through your business. So I actually believe that you need to have a good business attorney lined up early on. Now, having said that, 90% of my clients don't. <laughs> and even though that is my advice, and I wish we would be there, uh, Joe is exactly right. We are very often hired after LOI or right as the LOI is being prepared. And um, the only catch we have with LOI is if you have an LOI that doesn't address indemnification, it doesn't have a cap in it, when we go to do the asset purchase agreement, the attorney on the other side will say, the letter of intent didn't have a cap. The letter of intent said purchase price because it didn't say anything else. So when you're silent on those terms in the LOI, you might have an uphill battle. What you could do to protect yourself is to say a Uh, indemnification with cap and basket to be agreed upon in the definitive document. So then you've at least left open the possibility that there's a negotiation to still be had on that topic. Whereas if you simply leave it silent, the buyer's going to say, 
I know I what I say when I'm a buyer, I'm going to say, no, 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 no. There were it said indemnification. There were no caps. Yeah, you're going to. There you're were gonna, no baskets. You're going to you're going to say different things as the attorney for the buyer than you are for the seller. Right? Absolutely, I'm very good yeah. at switching hats. As a matter <laughs> of fact, I have represented clients who have been both buyers and sellers, and they laugh about the fact that my tone changes and the way I look at the document changes. Mm-hmm. But we do what we have to do for our clients. Yeah, for those listening, look, look like many of you, you don't want to contact a broker to talk about the valuation of the business or you know what it might be worth. Um, and I've had people tell me that um, because they don't want to feel like uh, they're committing. Um, you got to do the same thing with the attorney. I think you should have a call with a broker a year, two years in advance just to yeah. understand the valuation process and how to gauge what your discretionary earnings are on a monthly basis, quarterly basis, so you get a, an idea for the value. Instead of, instead of just listening to podcasts, instead of just listening to people in mastermind groups and their experiences, uh, because the full story is never told instead of just looking right. at listings and going, Oh, oh that's a, a, a 2.5 multiple. That's a three multiple. That's a four multiple. You don't get the full story. You, you can't do it that way. You should have a conversation and have it directly applied to your business and your business only because every business has its own unique qualities. The same applies, I think, as you're saying, Ro- Rochelle, to having a conversation with an attorney in advance, because if there's a problem with, the way that you've set up your LLC or the trademark or a design right. or anything like that. Right. You should, you should have those things addressed in advance. Uh, well worth it. Do you do uh, any, any, do you have an hourly charge for that first call? Do you have a free consultation to just talk about business? What, how does it work if somebody wants to reach out to you and have that conversation? Well, we offer a 20 minute free consultation to all new clients. So we do it telephonically. Most of our clients are not located. We're based in Tampa, Florida, okay. which is a lovely place to live and do business. Most of our clients are all over the world. So we do it telephonically or through Skype or some other online method. Uh, and we offer, we say 20 minutes. Sometimes it goes a little longer, depending on how in depth we get. And in that call, we can then talk to you about what you need and how to price what you need. So sometimes what you need immediately is, is really just a few hours of our time in consultation, and we'll bill it that way. Sometimes what you need is for us to dive in. Um, as a firm, we will do flat fees. We will do structured fees, meaning uh, – that, that you, a certain price to cover the LOI, another price to cover due diligence, a third price to cover the asset purchase agreement and actually do it in phases. Um, we will do capped fees. It all depends on the nature of your transaction and on how well we can get our arms around what you're asking us to do. So for instance, if we're doing a capped fee or a flat fee, we're going to be very specific about the services you're getting from us and things that are outside those services might be in addition. If we're doing an hourly rate, of course, we'll have some sort of retainer up front and we will be specific about what's included in those services, but you'll be billed by the hour. We try very hard to be transparent and um, easy for our clients to understand what they're being billed for and how they're being billed. Excellent. Excellent. Rochelle, listen, we're going to wrap it up here. I appreciate your, your time today. Can you uh, tell those listening how to reach you? How do they find you uh, either online or via, via phone call? Absolutely. So by phone, our number is 813-999-0199. And I am an extension 115. If you press zero, when you call that number, Ask for Layla, and she will set you up with me or one of our attorneys for an initial consult. And by email, I am Rochelle, R-O-C-H-E-L-L-E, at walk, W-A-L-K, lawfirm.com. And uh, we, we have a policy of responding to people within 24, at the most 48 hours, but we're usually pretty good about popping right back to you and uh, getting something set up. Terrific. We'll make sure that uh, that phone number, the email address, and the website address are in the uh, show notes as well. Uh, Rochelle, any last thoughts for those uh, listening that may be either buyers or sellers that you want to share? I, I just think in closing that when you think about buying or selling a business, due diligence 
is the most important thing you can do. So even if you're an experienced Amazon seller, whether you're a buyer or a seller, you need to know who you're doing business with. Get some, uh, if you're the buyer, certainly understand the brands you're buying and understand what you're trying to accomplish by buying those brands, what services you need. And frankly, if you're the seller, and you might be taking back seller paper, which is a promissory note, a seller promissory note, you're going to want to know who the buyer is. Make sure you understand, are they equipped to run a business like this? And if they're not, what kind of transition services do you need to provide them so they can hit the ground running? Know what kind of people there are. Check them out. If you're dealing with people who are squirrely, get out of the deal in the, before you even sign the LOI. But if you're dealing with good people, try and figure out how to make them successful because your success as a seller, especially if you're taking back a seller's promissory note or a consulting agreement, your success is going to be very much related to their success. I, I love your approach. You know, if you're, if you ever decide to leave the law business, uh, give us a call. <laughs> you may be a very, very, very successful advisor here at Quiet Life Brokerage. Well, thank you, Joe. <laughs> I appreciate that. And I uh, look forward to working with you again on some transactions. All right. Well, thanks for being a guest. I appreciate it. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Joe.